huge welcome. My name is Maria Murray. I am the founder of the Reading League. I, I was told to say that. And I'm a pre <laughs> oh my god, please. <laughs> and um, I am a very proud professor of literacy at Amazing SUNY Oswego. <laughs> And good morning, my name is Joreen Cook. I am the president of the Reading League and I am an early literacy coach at Syracuse City Schools. Okay, so it was two years ago, October 14th, that the Reading League was formed out of an idea that many of us who worked in various fields related to reading whoops, could create an organization that would serve as a go-to resource for educators. The Reading League is a nonprofit organization and we are primarily supported by volunteer efforts. Founding members realized that varied ex areas of expertise could result in a practical sought after PD um, organization for educators who want to know more about highly effective methods for teaching reading. So translating the body of research findings into practice is a huge challenge and it requires three elements, we believe. An awareness of what research has found to be highly effective, an understanding of how it can be implemented, and probably most important, support during that implementation. So knowledge in these three areas is what we are trying to provide. Is everyone able to hear me okay? Okay. The Reading League's overall mission is to increase the awareness, understanding, and use of highly effective evidence-based reading instruction. Two short years, we've gained 2,000 member supporters. We formed many collaborations with school and community partners. We really thank all who have been involved in the Reading League's growth, and we look forward to what is ahead. And we especially thank our conference chair, Michelle Story, I don't know where you are. Michelle. She's probably out helping someone. Michelle, are you here? Oh, thank you. She's in the back. OK. <laughs> um, and I want to give a special sh uh, thank you to Sheila Clonin, a board member who lives in Casanova. And she made such an extra effort for this conference here in beautiful Casanova, New York. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, Stephanie Bartling, are you here? Oh, well, you'll see Stephanie. Um, she is our coordinator slash director. We're still arguing over what she should be called, but I say she's our director. She's a lead person in making this conference happen um, from the programs to the vendors to the reception being held tonight. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I will give her many hugs today. A sincere and very inadequate thank you to all the board members who worked this last many months, uh, six months to pull this together conference together. Um, are there any board members in here that could do a quick stand and they're all out working. <laughs> See what I mean? Um, please tell them I thank them. Um, they are <laughs> devoted people. Uh, their passion for the Reading League's work and dedication is unrelenting. They all joined two years ago and no one has quit. No one has even slowed down on it. Um, we can't thank anyone and any one of them enough, it's impossible. They're brilliant. Um, we're very pleased to thank our sponsors, the vendors. We thank our keynote sponsors, Super Kids and the Pleasant T. Roland Foundation. Uh, they are uh, jointly sponsoring our keynote, which is next. Um, Pleasant T. Roland Foundation is also sponsoring our breakfast, which you see in the schedule. And we want to thank other signature sponsors, including Amplify, who's our panel discussion sponsor. Educational Solutions of Central New York for our afternoon refreshment break. We're going to need it. And um, Voyager Sopris, who's sponsoring our luncheon. Central New York Co Community Foundation is sponsoring all of the breakout sessions. There's three breakout sessions. OK, I'm almost done. So please visit those vendor tables. All of them feature amazing evidence-based resources for you to review. Highly effective reading instruction out there. Um, and book signings, last thing I have to say is they will take place where you registered this morning. So we're going to convert that area back over to the book signing place. And um, both uh, Mark Seidenberg and jo John Corcoran will be signing directly after this talk and during the breakfast break. Up for Joreen. Thank you, Maria. Good morning again. 
It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Seidenberg, our keynote speaker. Seidenberg is a cognitive neuroscientist who has studied reading and language since the disco era. His reading research addresses the nature of skilled reading, how children learn to read, the basis of differences in reading skill, and the neurosubstrate for reading using behavioral experiments, computational models, and neuroimaging. Mark S. Seidenberg is a Vilas Research Professor in the Department of Psychology in the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and author of Language at the Speed of Sight, How We Read, Why So Many Can't, and What Can Be Done About It. His book, which has received national acclaim, provides an overview of the advances in reading sciences and examines the disconnection between this research and educational practice, its impact on literacy, and how it might be overcome. Please join me as we welcome Dr. Mark Seidenberg. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here, and thanks for having me here. Um, has everyone seen this picture on the, uh, the internet? A lot of people seen this on the internet. It went around. So um, what we got here, we got some uh, zucchini. We got our taters and meters. And these southern speakers, tomatoes. Uh, we got our jalapenos, and this is my favorite one. We got our bale pepper. <laughs> uh, the sign's actually a fake, in the sense that it was constructed by the owner of the vegetable stand, and who purposely misspelled things this way as a, for his sign so that he could get more people to stop and buy his bale peppers. Uh, it is fun, however, to you know, illustrate um, an issue, which is, of course, that uh, people pronounce words differently, and the spelling may or may not reflect those pronunciations, a kind of classic problem. Um, so let me just say um, a bit about just who, who, I, who I am and why I'm here. Um, so I'm, I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin. Um, we have a lab there. It's run by myself and Professor Mary Ellen McDonald, uh, in which we study language in general, many things about language. Um, a lot of my research is about reading, but it's also about how children learn a first language. Um, McDonald's research is about production of language, and um, uh, we study at youth but many aspects of reading and language from a variety of perspectives. Uh, I also post sometimes on this blog, Language Log, which is run by Mark Liverman from the University of Pennsylvania. And some of you may want to look at it, because last night at 12.53 uh, AM, uh, I posted a, um, I did a post on um, something you might have heard about, which was a paper that came out last week in a very prestigious journal, uh, proceedings of the Royal Society B, uh, which claimed to have found a new cause for dyslexia, an overlooked one that had to do with some properties of the retina. Um, and this has been causing quite a lot of concern among uh, reading researchers and reading specialists and teachers and other people who are uh, attempting to help struggling readers. Um, so this goes into the study and provides a critique of it. And basically, um, the question isn't really whether, you might want to look at it. Uh, the question isn't really whether the discover, a new cause for dyslexia has been discovered, but why this terrible paper got published. Uh, it's, it's not good. It's not good. And it plays into a lot of really hoary stereotypes about dyslexia in a really unfortunate way. So I think it does a lot of, can do a lot of damage and I'm trying to undo a little of it by giving people a little guide to how to, what's actually in this paper. So um, sometimes I post about uh, reading and other topics on this uh, uh, blog and uh, you might take a look at it. Um, I'm also a reader and I've been a reader for a really long time. <laughs> Uh, I used to be cute. <laughs> I like the drink in the hand. <laughs> um, so the, I'm going to talk for a while, and then we have a block of time here. And so the, 
idea is to uh, let me say a few things and then open the floor for discussion. There's so many topics we could talk about and I'm at your disposal. So you can literally choose what we, can, should, we should be discussing and I think there'll be a lot of time for that. Um, so, you know, I'm a studied, scientist who studied language and reading and dyslexia for a long time. Um, and, you know, my concern is that there are too many people in the population who have limited reading skills or, or people who can read but don't want to um, or limit their reading to, you know, literacy light kinds of activities. Um, and, um, you know, my question is whether, whether, whether what we've learned about how reading works um, and how children learn um, could be put to better use. Um, you know, you reach a certain point in life, age, something, where you, you kind of say, uh, we, we think the science has been progressing pretty well, uh, and yet there are, continue to be um, large numbers of people who, are, who really have minimal reading skills, and so shouldn't we be able to do something about that? Um, and my argument is that, you know, the science is not the solution to every problem. It does not speak to every issue. It certainly doesn't speak to every issue in a classroom. And, and drawing the links between the research and practice is a difficult but necessary um, step. Um, and, um, but the problem is that that kind of conversation, that kind of interaction doesn't happen enough. And um, in the book that I wrote, I attribute this to really a pretty long-standing disconnect between the cultures of education and the cultures of science, and I try to give some history there. So this disconnection between the education and science has been detrimental to the children. Uh, I think it's detrimental for teachers because they're not given all the tools they could be given to be as successful as they want to be. Uh, and clearly it's not good for society to have a large percentage of people whose reading skills are, are minimal. Um, you know, literacy, the ability to read and write and spell, um, is endangered, it's under pressure for a variety of reasons. We have other sources of information now some of them come with, you know, moving images and bright, shiny colors. Um, and, and, and certainly our commitment to quality edu for education for all is under, under pressure as well. So um, reading has issues that uh, reflect things that are going on in the society at large. Uh, but it's true that educational practices could contribute to sort of maybe accelerating the design, decline of literacy as an essential skill. Um, you can make it harder for children to succeed in reading. Um, you can make it harder for teachers to succeed at what they want, the way they want to. Um, you might treat reading as one of only several literacies that um, are relevant, uh, something that's now, something, you know, that's an optional form of, literacy rather than essential. Um, and, and in laying out these arguments, I, I really make a point of stressing that this isn't a complaint about teachers. Uh, it's not a complaint about teachers. It's a complaint about the people who teach the teachers and about um, how well, they're, whether they're given the tools they need to succeed. Um, I think a lot of information that's relevant to educational practices withheld or discounted. Um, I think that barrier, there, there are barriers to bridge, building bridges between these different approaches. Um, it's very hard to form the co collaborations that really would move things forward. And so um, um, it's a situation that I don't think, that I tried to diagnose and really um, perhaps, um, so that we could think about, collectively think about what we could do to improve the situation. Uh, so I wrote a book. <laughs> it's heavily discounted on Amazon. 
Uh, there's going to be a paperback version. Uh, the thing I know about the paperback version is going to correct some typos that went and made it into this version, but they're also going to come with a darker cover because apparently this cover, people were picking it up and leaving fingerprints on it. <laughs> so now it's going to have a darker cover. Um, what's the book have? The book is, um, first of all, it's nine chapters about how reading works. Um, and then there's three chapters about, okay, given what we know about reading, what can we say about how's this relate to what goes on in classrooms and, and, and the history of reading instruction in this, in this country. I wanted to shine as bright a light as I could on the situation because, you know, it's been like this for a long time. Uh, for reading researchers like myself, it's been literally several decades of this disconnection between what we think are some basic facts about how children learn and how reading works and some basic assumptions about that, those things, um, uh, different assumptions about those things that dictate um, uh, what happens in the classroom. Um, so um, I, I also wanted to give people some ammunition. I wanted to give, have something that um, a parent or teacher or policymaker um, could use when some ideologue tried to sort of brush them off and say, we're the experts here, we know what's going on, um, and we will are, are really the ones who um, can decide what's appropriate for um, uh, helping kids learn to read. So I wanted to have, give somebody a, a little, um, something that they could use. Um, and, and there are some ideas about what we might do in the future, but I, can, you know, I don't have any special ability to um, predict the future or influence policy. Education is a huge enterprise. As we all know, it has lots of different stakeholders with differing um, commitments and pressures. And so I suggest some things, but you know, it's going to take. Um, a, an, a, an effort involving many, many people uh, from many different backgrounds to um, uh, make things better. Uh, it was published on January 3rd, and you might have missed it, uh, <laughs> because a lot of other stuff was going on. I, I, I certainly was not thinking at that point myself about, my focus was, attention had been drawn away from reading issues at that point as well. Um, so uh, here's a, just a brief list of some of the things that really got to me and finally pushed me over the edge and so that I could get down to actually writing about, about them. Um, I'll mention them briefly. These are the kinds of things we could talk about in the discussion section. Discussion section. The discussion if you'd like to. Um, one of them was the argument from a few years ago that low achievement is an economic issue, not an educational one. This is most closely associated with Diane Ravitch. And, you know, the idea was that um, educational system works fine. Literacy levels in the U.S. are fine, except for the lower income kids. So our, our performance as a country, our estimate of how well we're doing is being dragged down by the poor kids. Um, well, of course, poverty and low income and income disparities and so on are obviously a contributing factor here. But low achievement isn't just an economic issue, it's also an educational one, and the idea that we can't really do anything for the low kids from the low SES backgrounds and t because they're too poor to benefit really did not sit well with me and the idea that we can be happy with how well we're doing if we only look at the kids at the better schools really, really in, in higher income areas really did not seem right or fair to me. Um, a second thing is what I'd call the shadow police. So. Reading researchers have been just utterly naive. Um, so, you know, you do your research, and then you do your research again, 
and then there's someone else who does the research in another country or maybe in another language or in another writing system. Um, you see the converging sorts of evidence that lead to certain kinds of conclusions. You write your technical papers. Sometimes you write more general papers to try to bring this to the attention of a broader audience and so on. We think, you know, researchers think their job is done when they've done the studies, written them up, and then made some attempt to communicate them to a broader audience. But that's wrong because after a while you notice that every time a crucial study or set of studies or review or white paper document came out that called into question basic assumptions about uh, reading and literacy uh, and practices, classroom practices, um, came out, uh, we, we were shadowed by these other folks who took it upon themselves to explain to people like yourselves, educators, people who are on the front lines, what they, these studies really mean. And why, in fact, you could say, you know, move along, nothing here to see. Um, my former colleague, Steve Krashen, used to do this. Uh, Richard Allington, Ken Goodman, there were a number of these folks who could be counted on to provide the reinterpretation of the data so that uh, it, everyone could stay com in their comfort zone and not really have to um, deal with it. Um, which, you know, undermined its, its influence. Um, a third thing was what I would call den dyslexia denialism. So um, dyslexia, conditions that um, interfere with children learning to read, um, large body of research, making reasonable progress. Um, it's a difficult topic. It was the hardest chapter to write in this book um, just because it has such a long and difficult history and there are many different things going on having to do with, for example, how do we identify dyslexics What's the cutoff between being dyslexic and not being dyslexic? Um, does it come in various varieties? Um, what are the causes of dyslexia and so on? Uh, it is a very difficult literature and it was a hard, hard chapter to write. It's probably hard to read. Um, but there's a whole other world out there in which people say it doesn't exist. And that's wrong. I mean, whatever the difficulties there are in getting to the bottom of this complicated condition, uh, you don't, um, that does not uh, undermine the existence of the condition. Um, so, you know, um, and, and so there was a claim that dyslexia was a condition that was invented by teachers and educators to explain reading f their failures in teaching children to read. I don't know, this is one quote from uh, when uh, Richard Allington went to Baltimore and he's the Bill Gates of reading and uh, Allington does not mince words when it comes to his belief in the importance of properly teaching children how to read, You've gotta agree with that, uh, allowing them to read what interests them and giving them access to such material uh, at their reading levels. There's no such thing as a learning disability or dyslexia, Allington told the group citing research and his own 45 year experience of never finding anyone who couldn't, he couldn't teach to read. <laughs> dyslexia has a hundred year old over 100 year old research history. It predates modern concerns about achievement. And I can't understand, I don't know this person, I can't understand how anyone could conscien conscientably say that it had been invented by educators as an excuse for their educational failures. So I thought maybe some clarification would be helpful. 
Uh, th another thing that really concerned me was what seemed like outsourcing. So, you know, teachers are, have many responsibilities laid on upon them. The school systems are under pressure to take care of many things. And um, one of the things that happens is um, some things that used to get taught in the classroom or dealt with in the classroom are outsourced. Um, so for example, you know, spending time on class time on learning, practicing multiplication tables might not be done in the way that it was in the past. That could be dealt with outside the home. Uh, similarly, um, if phonics, um, uh, rather, you know, if you think that's important, then that's something that could be dealt with outside of the home. There's software and you can go to, you know, learning centers and so on if a parent is so motivated. Um, uh, there, there were a number of things, but related to reading that seemed to now be a, the, the curriculum were sort of middle class curricula based on the assumption that there would be somebody in the home who could support um, learning some of the basic skills involved in reading. And that, that seemed to me um, a way to, an obvious way to exacerbate the impact of differences in socioeconomic status because they assume that there's a parent in the home who speaks the language, who's available to interact with the kid who can teach, uh, who has access to the internet or uh, other kinds of materials, uh, who has the uh, money to spend on uh, the learning center or reading specialist or tutor. And uh, indeed, the, that, that might be effective for many kids, but it's only gonna be the people who can afford it. And so that, if you build that into your curriculum, the assumption that there'll be this outside stuff, then you're just gonna multiply existing um, differences in access to resources. The main thing that really got to me was the lost opportunities. I mean, there's just waste here. There's a lot of good research being left on the table. The research does not come with educational implications attached to it. There's additional work that's required to take that research and bring it into the classroom in ways that are um, relevant and effective and accommodate facts about um, teaching and classrooms and children that go beyond what the studies actually address. So, you know, it's not the claim that here, just read the science, you'll know what to do. The claim is, here, if you understand the science, it might change how you think about what you're doing and it might lead people to find, be, have some productive insights about more, what would be effective practices. Okay, so, um, you, you know, you publish a book and some people still read. Um, I got carried away in the book with some of the topics that I thought were really cool, but are sort of nerdish. Uh, you're allowed to skim chapter three. Uh, we are actually um, writing a, a, we are writing a study guide for the book because it covers a really broad, I, it, it covers a broad range of topics that, um, met, you know, Nobody could be expected to have background in all of them, and, and indeed, um, I think it would be helpful to have um, a kind of a supplementary guide, and so we're going to pr um, produce one and just put it out there for free. Um, but the book comes out, and you know, you never know who's going to read it or if anyone's going to read it. Um, and of course, if the cultures are as separated as I've said, you don't know if it's going to just speak to the people who are already ready for the message and not get to the folks who really kind of um, might benefit. So um, I don't know. Maybe you have to play a long, long game because this kind of change doesn't occur overnight. Um, there's some important topics to consider. Hopefully there's going to be this time for questions, maybe we'll want to discuss them. Here's a few I'll just toss out. Um, you could, uh, so there's this concept of multiple literacies. 
So print is just one of them because we're in a modern era in which there are other kinds of media. Um, there are some arguments that this would possibly empower um, diverse populations. For example, um, might be useful for people who have serious reading or learning disabilities to have alternative ways of taking in information. Uh, it might be relevant to people who um, are not um, native speakers of English or um, who speak a non-standard dialect of English. Um, it might provide an alternative that would be helpful. Um, is that a good idea or is that a way of actually maintaining, you know, this high percentage of people who don't, don't read? Uh, dyslexia, does it exist? Yes. Is it relevant to education? Yes. Is it a desirable difficulty? So that was a focus of a book by Malcolm Gladwell from a couple of years ago. Uh, we could talk about it, but you know, uh, just let no dyslexia is not a desirable dis difficulty. And Gladwell asks, you know, dyslexia is this thing that causes children to struggle. But would you wish it upon your kid? Because he goes through some really circumstantial evidence to suggest that it might be beneficial. Uh, achievement gaps. So a lot of my own current research is about reading gaps between, between different populations, of course. And, you know, uh, one of the points that we make in this research uh, is that um, some of the gaps, for example, between African Americans and whites, um, every other factor aside, which include differences in opportunity, um, some part of the gap is actually sort of built in. It's built into the conditions that exist which differ for these groups. Um, in particular, the African-American kid who is speaking a variety of African-American English in the home and community actually has more to learn once they get to school than a kid who's already speaking the mainstream dialect that's being used in the classroom and in, in the books they're learning to read. So the groups have different distances to go to get to the same developmental milestones. So the comparisons are not fair. And indeed, some part of that gap is built in, is going to be there, even if you could factor out all the other um, factors that in influence outcomes. It's a controversial topic. I could um, discuss it further. Um, there's some current research that might be interesting to talk about. What I would call the, you know, so much to learn, too much to learn, too little time problem. It applies to things like vocabulary, where we know there are differences in children's spoken language experience that show up as differences in things like vocabulary knowledge at the start of schooling. Um, and those gaps, those differences in vocabulary are very hard to overcome because they're large and there isn't enough time in the day to teach the kids all the words they don't know. Um, this is an area where um, there is some very good, a lot of research on something called statistical learning which might suggest some efficient ways, more efficient ways to try to close um, these kinds of um, uh, differences in, you know, vocabulary applies to phonics, applies to some other kinds of things, spelling. Um, and the other thing would, you know, this is a variety of topics. The other thing is just the concept that we don't really want to experiment on children in classrooms. You know, we, we, the, the idea that we'll just roll out a program because someone thought it was a good idea and it had some logic to it and we would try it out, uh, which I think has happened um, repeatedly, uh, is just saying we're going to experiment on kids during a critical point in their lives when they really they need to be learning. Um, so um, we could talk about that too. Um, 
So um, I think now what I'd like to just basically turn to is a sort of underlying issue, which is why, why bother? I mean, would, sh sh do you really need to pay attention to this stuff? Is this just the scientists saying, loving what they do and thinking everyone else should too? Um, and I think it is a fair, it's totally fair question. Um, so, you know, how much of this research on child development and learning and reading and language is actually something that needs to be um, attended to? I mean, people did learn to read before all this science existed. And uh, many people do still manage to become skilled readers, thankfully. Many teachers are highly effective. Um, and it's certainly teachers have more experience with children than any researchers do. So, you know, the scientists love this stuff. And uh, maybe you find it cool. Some of it's cool. Um, but why should teachers or ed anyone who, educators, schools of education, why should anyone else really have to care about the details? And um, what I want to do with just the rest of my remarks is try to convince you that it is important to pay attention to with one example. So, um, so in the book I t start out by talking about the relationships between reading and speech and you know, we think about reading as being visual, but actually the starting point for reading is spoken language. Um, and there's a lot of research on this topic. It conducted in many labs and countries and languages and writing systems that are all pointing to the same thing. So this research is not, these conclusions are not dependent on research that is from one country or one lab or funded by one research agency. There's quite a lot of paranoia about that in this country. We're talking about a vast community of researchers who don't agree on everything, but there are some basic things that we've converged on. One of them is that for people who are literate, reading and speech become deeply intertwined from behavior to brain. So a uh, long time ago when I was starting out as an experimental psychologist, um, this was the first experiment that I published in a psychology journal was about um, college students doing a rhyming task. Um, so they were in the lab and they're listening to pairs of words and all they have to do is decide if they rhyme or not, which is an easy task for college students. And the um, Oh, good. Um, and the critical fact, the, the details of the experiments are really critical here, but the main th thing was that um, there were um, rhymes like stone and clone, where there's overlap in spelling, and then there were ones like stone and blown, where there's much less overlap. And, you know, this is an experiment that's, they're only listening to things. There's no reading involved. And the finding from the study, and it, several others it replicates easily and I have a demo on the book website that allows you to try this at home. Um, the effect is that people are faster to detect, people can judge these things as rhymes correctly and there's other ones that don't rhyme of course. Um, but um, the ones that are, have more overlap in spelling, people make decisions more rapidly. It's as though, you know, these are closer these both rhyme, but these are more similar than these are. So something about the spelling was influencing how people judged spoken words and whether they rhymed. At the time, that suggested to us that for some, possibly because, well, because through the use of spoken and written language, these codes somehow become very closely associated. And we've since learned quite a lot more about that. Um, we know that um, spelling p penetrates people's use of spoken language from other kinds of things, so you folks probably all know about these um, 
phoneme deletion tasks like say split without the p, which um, actually is a hard task and is very dependent on kids' knowledge of spelling. Uh, and there was a wonderful, clever study a number of years ago um, by Uta Frith and others um, in which they had um, good and poor readers um, do the phoneme deletion task, but they included stimuli like lamb. So, you know, say lamb without the m. And some of the good readers would say lab. They're supposed to say They're supposed to say, um, la, because the B is silent, folks. So if you're a skilled reader and you have this integration of the spoken and written forms of the language, and then you ask somebody, say lamb without the m, you can see the spelling penetrate their responses. Now, this doesn't mean that phonemes don't exist. It means that the phonemes depend in part on your knowledge of spelling. Uh, here's an example of how spoken language penetrates reading. So we're talking about silent reading for comprehension, uh, for you know the usual some of the usual um, purposes. Um, so you know you have to read something like this to yourself. So it's you know permit me to show you my new parking permit. These are two different words. The stress pattern on the syllables differs. This is permit, and this is permit. The verb is usually permit. The noun is usually permit, strong weak. And that's something that you actually have to compute when you're, to get the meaning of the word correctly when you're reading silently. So, you know, if you reverse the stress patterns, the sentence doesn't make sense. Let me see if I can do this. Permit me to show you my new parking permit. Doesn't doesn't mean anything. So there's a variety of properties of the sounds of words, such as syllabic stress, that are relevant to meaning, to, to understanding sentences, to understanding texts. There are others. There are ones about intonation patterns that extend over, that extend over sentences none of which is explicitly marked in the writing. It's not that there are symbols for these things. Well, to understand this, a text, a person has to be implicitly computing this stuff to get to the meaning. And of course, you can do many experiments that show that, yes, indeed, people do this. Um, in the brain, brain evidence is sort of leaking out into the public consciousness. And um, one of the things that people have heard a lot about are um, the idea that there are distinct modules for different kinds of information. And one of the prominent examples is something called, that's been called the visual word form area. The visual, visual word form area is supposed to be the spelling content file. It's the part of your brain where the spellings of words are stored. There's quite a lot of, um, evidence and talk, research on this, talk about this. A lot of it is neuroimaging evidence. Um, that idea is not really accurate. It's, there are representations of spelling in the brain. They're not located in a single place. And the prominent one that people call the visual word form area is actually penetrated by knowledge of spelling. It is shaped by how, sorry, by knowledge of spoken language, and by meaning. It's shaped by how we read, what we are reading for, and the connections between print and sound and meaning. There isn't an area of the brain that is only coding spelling and another one that is only coding speech. These things are interacting with one another through development and shaping each other, such that when you are literate, the representation of spoken language changes, the representation of spelling is penetrated by your knowledge of a spoken language, and they are indeed intertwined. This is just one of the kinds of studies that was done um, in which uh, it was a 
I'm not going to go into the details. It was a study using this method called uh, uh, TMS, uh, transit magnetic uh, stimulation. Uh, it sounds terrible, but it's basically applying a very light uh, magnetic field to over the surface of the brain. It's safe. Um, and um, it induces disruption in the area over which it's a figure eight shaped kind of magnet and you literally put it over the person's head. Um, and it delivers a very, um, there's a variety of ways to do it, but it delivers a uh, magnetic field which causes a minor disruption in processing within certain parts of the brain. It sounds terrible. There are videos of it on um, YouTube. There's uh, uh, where you can see somewhat the effects. Um, one of the effects is it interferes with um, processing. So you can apply this to speech parts of the brain, you can apply it to the parts where the spellings seem to be very prominent, and you can look at what kind of interference is produced very temporarily. And this bottom line of this study was that if you apply this stimulation over they redid my rhyming study from years ago. And what they found was that the spelling effect that we found was eliminated if you disrupted processing in a speech area, suggesting that the spelling was indeed up there shaped, up there with the information about the sounds of words having shaped, shaped them in the way I've been describing. It's just an example of the kind of methods that people now can use to see how are these things represented and how separate are they. Um, this is a second study I really like a lot. It's from Haskins Labs, a group of researchers there. Uh, Jay Rickle was the lead author. So uh, they did this heroic study. Uh, they look at reading in four languages and the, they picked languages that have very different, the spoken languages are different and how they're organized, and the writing systems are too. Um, there's Chinese, Mandarin, um, there's English, uh, there's um, Hebrew, which has a very different kind of writing system, um, and then there's Spanish, which is an alphabet like ours, but the correspondences between spelling and pronunciation are a lot more consistent than they are in English. So you've got people who've learned to read in these different languages, that have different kinds of writing systems. And what they show in this study is, what they evaluate is the extent to which the processing of spoken language in the brain overlaps with the, what happens when people read. And the claim is that the same thing happens across these different writing systems. The areas that are responsible for reading and speech overlap a great deal. There's a high degree of overlap and it's not, it seems to be universal, it's not dependent, it doesn't happen in one language and writing system and not another. This is another study from the Haskins group where the lead author was someone I really deeply admired, Don, Don Schenkweiler. Don Schenkweiler has been doing studies with struggling, older struggling readers for a long time. She's looking at you know, middle school and older. He's done behavioral studies for many years and now we have other methods we can also use. And this is a really beautiful study because what it did was it looked at kids, older teens and you know, old, older kids and um, asked, we know that there, some of them were poor readers, some of them were better readers, but the question that he asked was is the degree, this the, is the um, reading skill, the level of reading skill associated with the degree of integration of print and sound? What the study shows is that the more skilled readers show more overlap between reading and comprehending spoken language. The poorer readers are the ones who haven't achieved that integration. They're not good readers, they don't have enough um, facility with print for this integration to have occurred. So it's like what's happening in typical development when the kid's becoming a skilled reader is that these systems are kind of docking. 
And what happens when the kid is not reading or is struggling with reading is they don't get that document. And that makes reading much more difficult. So these are a variety of kinds of evidence that all speak to the integration of print and sound. Uh, chapter three, which you can skim, is about this is actually a basic property of writing systems. And indeed, you know, uh, I hope I'm not running out of time here. Am I doing okay? Uh, so writing systems, writing systems, where'd they come from? Um, uh, cave paintings date from, you know, 37,000 years ago. And then the first writing systems don't start showing up and for, you know, 30,000 years. I mean, it, it takes an enormous amount of time to go from drawing pictures, which seems communicative and seems pretty closely related to, re to writing, and the first emergence of writing in the Middle East and other locations around 5000 BC. What took so long? What took so long? And then after those first writing systems like cuneiform, you know, uh, showed up, it took another 3,000 years or so to perfect them, to get them into functional systems like the ones we have today. This is enormously, this is slow. This is amazingly slow. What was so hard about this? What was so hard about this was figuring out how to get writing systems that were workable, and what was required was, the solution was, Writing systems to have to have symbols that represent cues to the sound and meaning of words. That's what writing systems do. They are representations of spoken language that provide cues to what words sound like and what their meanings are like. This is very clear in written Chinese, where many of the characters corresponding to what we would call words have two parts. So this is the word for mother. It's got one part that's a semantic cue, female. It's got another one that's a cue to the sound. In isolation, this means horse. But in this word, it's just providing a cue about sound. So if you know this cue to sound and you know that this means female, then you can put together that this is the word mother. This is a beautiful example of what happens with some variation in every writing system. Cues to sound, cues to meaning, put them together, and that makes for a workable system. One question you might ask, if you're, if you're really a kind of word nerd, is um, this is supposed to be a phonetic cue. It's supposed to be a cue to the sound. It's the syllable ma with a different tone. But in isolation, it means horse, which is a pretty common word. And so you could ask, well, the way this word is constructed, you're not supposed to be paying attention to the meaning here. It's only supposed to be the sound. Do people actually separate those things out? Uh, we have studies in our lab which suggest that people can't actually ignore what is actually irrelevant semantic information. They don't just treat this as, it is a phonetic cue, but they also activate the meaning. What it means is that there's a little bit of horse that penetrates the meaning of mother. There are many, many characters of this sort. We could talk about it if you're interested. I mean, it's an example of how writing might change your concepts. Okay, let me try to sum this up. All of this is saying that reading depends on speech. It, goes, it starts with the fact that writing systems are codes for representing spoken language. They don't literally represent everything about speech. They leave many things out. But they do represent basic information about the sounds of words. We know that spoken language skills vary among young children. We're now much more sensitive since the Hart and Risley study and the many that have followed it, about the differences in children's spoken language experience and how that affects their progress in school, 
in reading and in other areas. Spoken language deficits, things related to um, um, either experience being lacking or also constitutional things, things about the child that make it interfere with acquiring spoken language in subtle ways also have an enormous impact on reading. So as I've said, the two codes are deeply entwined from top to bottom. So if people have been paying attention, would there actually have been reading wars over whether reading is visual or phonological, or whether you should actually try to kind of encourage kids to figure out how print and speech are related? These, these, this research is saying that that question is a non-starter because the systems are not distinct. They are not distinct in writing, they are not distinct in behavior, and they are not distinct in your brain. And so to try to teach a kid to keep them distinct goes against all this evidence. So the research is relevant and one ignores it at one's peril. Okay, so like I've said, I don't think science is the, it's not mindless scientism here, it's not the scientists saying we have the answers to everything. There's a lot of research that could be made better use of. And I think the obstacles to using it are really cultural. They are not. They are communication. Um, and the barriers are very difficult to break down. People who have been in this field a long time, researchers, all have the experience of just not being able to get in the door. People don't want to read it. Um, one of the things I end up talking about in the book is I try to place this kind of polarization of views and separation of cultures in a broader context, in a modern context. What I think is actually that what's happened with reading and with education and science more generally is a kind of early example of the polarization over many issues that exists in society. And many of the same factors contribute to the polarization. It has to do with um, channels of communication, networks of communication, who speaks to whom, um, the proliferation of information on unreliable information and various sources. Um, it, it's also reminiscent of many of the debates over things like, for example, gun control, um, in the sense that, or climate change, in the sense that, you know, when someone is presented with data that seem to pretty convincingly contradict it, one of their basic assumptions, the response is not, hmm, we need to kind of think about how to move closer together here. In fact, what research studies, sociolinguistic, sociological studies are showing is that that can actually lead to a hardening of the positions and the taking of more extreme positions rather than what you might have thought in the past, which was that information would bring people together. I think that that's a model applies pretty well to what's happened in education and science. So I think there's a problem here. And uh, you know, it's easy to diagnose, it's harder to know what to do, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sensitive to that. So thanks for listening. Um, and at this point, um, I'd like to open, if we have time, open the floor to discussion of what I'm at your service and would be happy to talk about anything that I actually have competence to talk about. <laughs> Thank you.